Good morning, Faith Fellowship. Happy Sabbath. Delight to be with you all this morning. And a good morning to our Faith Fellowship family online. What a joy that each one of you are tuning in and that we can be together to worship the Lord on this amazing Sabbath. And to each one of the fathers, um, I say happy Father's Day. And thank you so much for being a light in this world. Today we're going to start a two-part study titled, They Refuse to Love the Truth. There is a time coming on this world. We've talked about understanding the last 1,335 days of Earth's history, and we talk a lot about the first four trumpets. But today I want for us to turn our focus to the fifth trumpet and the horrific curse that is coming to planet Earth when the fifth trumpet sounds. Most people, and I'm talking about Christians because I can't expect people in the world to know anything that's in God's word. Most Christians have no clue that God is going to turn the entire control of this planet over to Satan. Clueless that Satan is going to rule this planet. And you and I need to be ready for this time. God is going to be counting the worshipers and those that are not going to measure up, that are not living by faith, that don't know the Lord personally, are going to wind up on the other side. And it's something that we need to take very seriously as we look at this this morning. Let's begin by asking the Holy Spirit to come and open up our hearts and minds this morning. Wonderful Lord, we are grateful for this time together. This is an, a huge topic, and it is something that you warn us about in your word. And if those are present or hear this message have not heard it before, Lord, may they be open to understand of these curses that are coming upon the world and why it is that you are going to let things unfold the way that they do because all that you do, Father, is good and perfect. Please help us to hear what the Spirit is saying to us today in Jesus' name, amen. Open up your Bibles, if you would, to Revelation chapter 13 because if you've never entertained that this entire world is going to be ruled by the most evil being that has ever been created, I want you to read it with your own eyes. Revelation 13. Let's go to verse, oh, verse 4. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. They also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Down to verse 7. He, this, this great force, was given power to make war against the saints and to do what? To conquer them. He was given authority over every tribe, every people, every language, and every nation. God is going to give total control at an appointed time to the devil. It's what the fifth trumpet is about, and we'll look more at these details next week. I want you to, to kind of back away and look down on planet Earth in your mind and first understand that the Bible is an incredible story about a God who loves his children, who is building a family from faithful, from the faithful, and who will save anyone that desires to live by the laws of love. Anyone. I know that you hear me say this over and over again. I want you to continue to fold this into your thinking as we talk about 
these huge subjects because it's hard to comprehend why God would allow such a horrible thing to happen. In fact, it's called a curse. The first four trumpets devastate the earth so that God can get the attention of all of his children. It takes that. It's sad to say that it takes the devastation of this planet to get our attention. And then the last three trumpets are woes or curses upon the earth. And God gives the devil control for a reason. Understand that God created angels first to be a part of his family and then human beings. And God loves relationships. He's all about relationships. And he created angel children to be a part of his family. And he taught them and they lived the laws of love. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. And they lived in incredible union and perfection and love for a period of time. We don't know how long that was, but for a period of time. But one day, the first created angel, the most beautiful of all the angels, the one given the most power and the most authority of all created beings, had a change of heart. Instead of loving God first, his attention turned toward himself. There came a transition where he loved himself more than he loved God and certainly more than he loved others. And when confronted with the truth, when God confronted Lucifer and one-third of the angels that believed his lies about God and sided with him, they refused to love the truth and so be saved. It started in heaven. They refused to believe that Jesus Christ was the creator and that he was to be worshipped. And because they refused to bow to the authority of Jesus Christ, they had to be expelled from heaven. And Lucifer had already had so much practice at deceiving others. He was an expert. We know that he at least deceived 200 million angels because we know that that number is in the Bible in uh, Revelation with the fifth trumpet in Revelation 7 and 8. It names that 200 million angels come out of the abyss, at least 200 million that he deceived. So that's pretty good at being a liar and being able to twist the truth and being able to convince others to believe the way that you believe. So imagine he comes down here to this earth and here's Adam and Eve. And they were told not to eat from this one tree. And I have no doubt that God warned them that the deceiver was out there. And that they needed to stand guard and be obedient. If you are simply obedient, then he can't bother you. But one day we know that Eve fell prey to the grand deceiver. And she was no match for him. Who could possibly stand against a deceiver like Satan? And so Eve was deceived. And one of the, one of the most wonderful things about God is his love and and how that translates into mercy. And God does not hold someone uh, to blaspheme him, to commit the unpardonable sin that is sincerely deceived. She was tricked. She was deceived. She believed the lie. You won't really die. You won't really die if you eat this fruit. And... That lie exists to this day. To this day, across all religions, people don't think that they really die. You, your body stops working and your spirit goes and lives somewhere else. Some people believe you, you live, you know, this is my 11th life or this is my 25th life. I just, I've been going around. Or simply you just either go to one place or another. But really, we don't really die. Our body 
stops working and our spirit moves on to whatever else, whatever you've been taught. There's a very small group of people, a minority of the minority of Christians that understand what death really is, and that it's a pause button called sleep, and that those that have died are sleeping until, as Abby and I talked about, one of two wake-up times. We all want to be in the first wake-up time, not the second. So God allowed Lucifer to spread his propaganda, to bring his lies, and he has continued to spread lies about God, and people decide whether they want to believe truth, stand for truth, or whether they get wrapped up and tangled up in the devil's lies. Always a decision that you and I have to make. God will not ever condemn someone for sincerely believing a lie and being tricked. But God is all about truth, and when he brings the truth, you and I make a decision about whether we want to stand and live for truth or whether we won't. And haven't we all been there before? And God has been so patient as he is teaching us the truth about himself, and he continues to woo our hearts and to change our hearts. Well, what happened to Lucifer is that he lost his first love. His first love and your first love and my first love should be God. When God is not our first love, we are in trouble. In fact, that is our biggest work in staying faithful is keeping God number one. That is part of working out our salvation with fear and trembling is that we do not allow the devil to shift our focus from God to other things, even good things. Good things can become bad things when they rise above God. And Lucifer got so wrapped up in his own self that he became corrupt. He became contaminated and he has spread his contamination to us. It's called sin. It's a virus that will destroy and kill everything good if left unchecked. God's people are infected with this virus. That's you and me. And those of us that claim to be in the inner court, we have to be so careful that we are not part of the spirit of prostitution that Hosea talks about in his, uh, in his speaking to Israel, that we, the inner court, have allowed a spirit of prostitution to enter the church, and that we are looking away from truth for the sake of not confronting others and for the sake of not um, offending people, sin is not being called out. So instead, we would rather offend God than offend others that are around us. And God is very offended at the things that are going on in his church. I want to talk about several things that take place when the church has prostituted itself to the world. Number one is that there is no fear. There is no fear of the Lord. That means that those preaching the gospel, a watered-down gospel, are presenting a view of God that is non-threatening. Most people do not want a threatening view of God. And so we push the judgment word out of our mindset but that's the first angel's message in Revelation 14. Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Are we not waking up that this is coming first to the church? God is going to judge. The fact that you and I are here on the Sabbath day desiring to come away from the world is not enough. The Sabbath didn't start at 10 o'clock this morning. The Sabbath started last night. What have we been doing from sundown to the time we got to church? How have we invested that time? 
Is this time really set apart? Are we able to divide common from holy? Are we able to do that? Or is, or is Sabbath just about coming to church or just watching online or going to church somewhere? Because if that's all we have, we are going to be in the group that refuses to love the truth. There is a price to pay to love the truth. And either, if you and I are living during the last three and a half years of Earth's history, we are going to be pressed like never before. And right now, we can come to worship on Sabbath. We can make excuses and do something else. We can spend the time any way we want. And nobody bothers us. The time is coming when keeping the Sabbath is going to be a matter of life and death. That's what this word is telling us here. That the devil, the dragon, is going to be given total control of the world. And you and I, if we're not standing squarely on the rock of Jesus Christ, we are going to be a part of the inner court that is purged and that hears the words from Jesus, I never knew you. The worst words that you and I could ever hear, I never knew you. You showed up to church, but that's all there was. There was no being still with me so that I could bring conviction into your life. Thank you, Christopher, for that message on being still. We could study Psalm 46.10 for the rest of the year and, and barely even begin to touch what that truly means to be still and know that he is God. So the church is teaching a non-threatening view of God. We are in trouble. And people become comfortable in their sin when they're not afraid of being judged and when they're not afraid of God. And we're not talking to be afraid of God the way that Adam and Eve were when they ran and hid from him. Sin did that to them. Sin does that to you and I. We want to run away because we've done something wrong. But having that fear that there is a judge and that he says he's going to judge us according to what we have done We get judged on our choices, and if we don't choose to allow Jesus Christ to cover us with his righteousness, our righteousness is filthy rags. God wants to see how we demonstrate our faith, and faith expresses itself how? Through love. Yes, faith expresses itself through love, and what kind of love? Love for God. Love for others always comes to the royal law that is the mantra of heaven. It's not only what God tells us to live under, it is who they live under. It is the law that they live under. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, they all love each other more than themselves. We don't know that kind of love. And if we don't have a healthy fear of God and understand that judgment is coming, then we are going to be lost. And the truth, we won't be able to tell the difference between truth and deception. Think about the sexual immorality that exists in the church. In our study last year, through the Conquer series, we discovered that close to 70% of all men in the church view pornography. In the church. The world, it's consumed with that. In the church. And over half of preachers view pornography. It is a huge problem. So how can those that are steeped in sin call sin out? How can you... Preach from the pulpit that people living together is not okay. That God is not okay with allowing gay people to have leadership in the church. 
Who's going to stand against that? It's taking over. Even in Sabbath-keeping churches, this is taking over. Because no one wants to confront sin, and no one wants to call sin by its right name. And it always comes down to, well, then we don't love people. We love people, but we love God more. And we live by his standard, and we won't water down the truth to suit anybody. Because then we won't know what the church is supposed to look like. Does a church even look like Jesus Christ? No, it doesn't. So who are we? The fact that we are here on this day and that we are desiring to come away from the world, are we desiring to come away from the world in every other way? Are we desiring to love people but to stand on the truth? Does your love for God give you the strength that you need to stand and to speak up? I'm not saying to judge. God's already given his judgment here. He's telling us what's going to happen, and he tells us how to live. People are comfortable with all kinds of stuff in their lives in the sexual immorality, but that's not all that there is. You and I need to learn how to separate holy living from common living every single day. If you are only desiring holy living on the Sabbath, what are you doing with all the other six days? We worship God with our life. How we work is an offering to the Lord. How we talk is an offering to the Lord. How we treat each other is an offering to the Lord. How we praise and how we thank is an offering for the Lord. How we are grateful for everything that we have is an offering to the Lord. How we live every day is worship. We cannot think that because we know about the Sabbath and that we come here on the Sabbath, that that is enough. It's not enough. That keeping the Sabbath is a way that we show the Lord that we love him on this day, but what happens on all the other days? You see, people aren't fearful of God, and even those that have been keeping the Sabbath have gotten so comfortable in it. We can show up here to church, never have opened our Bible in the morning, because we love our pillow more than we love God. So we, we're stuck to our pillow in the morning. We can't detach from it to get up and to even have a prayer time with the Lord before we come to church. Because you know why? It's not a habit the other six days. So why would we do it on the Sabbath? We don't have to be to work at 8 so we can sleep in till 9.30 and try to slide in here by 10.15. Who are we? Who are we? Are we taking the way that we live seriously? Do we know that we are the last generation and that God desires to use us as ambassadors for his great name? And in order to do that, we have to have a healthy fear of the Lord. We have to understand that we answer to the Lord and that he is not going to tell us that our sin is okay ever, in any way, shape, or form. There's never an excuse for that. Number two is a hardened heart. That comes from pride ruling. Pride rules. The heart is hardened. The spirit cannot reach us. It cannot bring conviction into our lives. Change can't happen. And I'm talking about a hardened heart because it there are Christians walking around with great bitterness, holding on to grudges for things that were done to them and we can't get over them. That is a hardened heart. We have to let go of things done to us that were wrong, no matter what. Because God's not going to tell you that it's okay for you to be bitter and hateful and mean because of what someone's done to you. When Jesus was being nailed to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the attitude that you and I are to have. Father, forgive them. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And But you know what? That goes for you and me. If we're not covered, God will repay us what we're due. Because we're due the same thing 
for those that we are holding grudges and bitterness against. We have to let things go. Bitterness is part of that virus that will kill everything that the Holy Spirit is trying to do in you. All the seed and all the plants and all the fruit that the Spirit wants to grow in you, if you harbor bitterness, then you are not going to be able to produce fruit. Bitterness will snuff it out. Holding on to, to grudges and being prideful. Having a prideful heart means you have to be right about everything. You never can consider. You can't listen. You, you wind up with a hardened heart because you're unwilling, first of all, to listen to God and to hear what he has to say. So you're certainly not going to be able to be a peacemaker because peacemakers have to be willing to confront and to work things out. We have to be willing to work things out. And that means I may have to compromise and I don't have, might not be able to be right about everything. I'm not talking about anything as God's law. I'm talking about personal preferences that we allow to take over our lives. And, you know, I'm the potluck leader and I'm always going to be the potluck leader. Nobody can ever be the potluck leader because I am the best potluck leader that ever walked the face of the earth. And I am going to be so offended if someone tries to take that position for me. You know, silly little things that we can, all, we can all be. This is how it is. And we, you know, and I'm right. And how I do it is how it's right. And I bring the best decorations for the tables. And I do this and I do that. And I'm me, 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 me. And so when we want to be peacemakers, we're going to have to lay some of those things aside to let someone else have their opportunity. And you all know what I'm talking about. You can take this to any arena of, of life. Hardened hearts are unwilling to be loving and kind and work things through because they're always about just simply being right and, and having control. You remember Pharaoh, how God sent Moses and Aaron to tell him that he was to let God's people go? And he said, who is God that I should listen to him? I'm not going to let God's people go. Well, finally, God started putting some pressure on him so he started to say, okay, 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 if you'll just stop this plague, I'll, I'll let your people go. And as soon as God let off the pressure, what would happen? Eh. Are you and I like that? That God's putting pressure on us about stuff and we say, Lord, okay, I'll stop, only to finally think God's stopping and then we go right back to what we're doing. See, the end game to that is what happened to Pharaoh at the end. He never really did repent. And he wound up drowned. And the only difference for us is it won't be death by water. It'll be death by fire. Same thing. There is a Pharaoh that lives inside of every one of us. It's, it's the carnal side of us. And he, his characteristic is a hardened heart. Number three is tolerance that we are willing to tolerate things that are going on when we know better, but we're cowards, basically. We're cowards, and we don't want to, we don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers. We want to be peacekeepers. We want to keep peace. That means your go-to is let's just hold hands and sing kumbaya. That's always a good Let's just sing a song together, hold hands, and everything's going to be okay. But no one's willing to do the hard task of confronting for the sake of truth. And if you and I are not desiring to walk and live in the truth now, are we that foolish to think that when the time comes and God's judgments begin, all of a sudden, in the worst time in earth's history, we're all of a sudden going to have this great courage and want to do what's right. Remember that the inner court gets measured first. Don't forget that the inner court gets measured first because right now is when God is preparing our hearts. Right now is when we are allowing him to mold us and change us and refine us and discipline and correct now is a time to learn these lessons to be able to walk into tribulation or into your tribulation could be today. 
You could be walking into some kind of tribulation in your own life. And how prepared are you for it? Are you going to crumble? And are you going to fall away because you just thought God would take care of everything and you'd never have to have any trouble in your life? See, God uses trouble to refine us. And God uses trouble so that we can see how we deal with it. It does with me. Well, Letty, let's see. How'd you do with that trouble? Yeah, you're right. Not so well. What did you learn from this? God uses trouble to teach us. We show a lot of who we are in trouble. Anybody can look good when the, when the waters are calm. Oh, yeah, I love the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Woohoo! I love everybody. I love everybody. And then trouble comes and you don't love anybody. <laughs> it's who we are. We can't live in tolerance. Remember Eli, the high priest that allowed his sons to desecrate the sanctuary? He couldn't discipline his own kids. And they grew up to be men that defiled the sanctuary and also the entire system was defiled. Are you and I defiling God's house by the way that we're living? Are we bringing reproach? We really need to be mindful of these things. These are serious times that we're living in. We don't want to be people that are surprised by the things that come when God has been telling us what is coming. He's given us the map. We just don't know the timing. The commander has not said, no more delay. When he says no more delay, whoa, watch out. Day one has arrived. What happens in the church that tolerates is that change can't take place. Change cannot take place because no one is willing to call out sin. And the church settles for unity for the sake of unity, not unity for the sake of truth. There's a big difference. If we're not united in truth, then our unity is delusion, and it's a huge falsehood. Also, when we tolerate, we become very numb to sin. We just, we see it, and it doesn't even bother us anymore. We see people doing stuff. We we hang out with people that talk yucky and joke inappropriately, and we just, we don't want to say anything because they might not invite us again. They might not like us, so we just kind of put up with it. But birds of a feather... There's a reason there's that saying. We become like who? By beholding, we are changed. We become like them instead of us standing for what's truth and saying, you know, I don't appreciate that kind of talk. I don't want to hear that kind of joking. It's not okay. Taking God's name in vain is not okay. That's my Lord. Instead, we just tolerate. We just put up with it. And before we know it, we're just like them. We're people that can't stand up to anything. We're just, we're just a noodle. One big noodle that can't do anything for the Lord. And we're so, but we're a royal priesthood. We are called to declare the praises of a God who called us out of darkness. But are we more comfortable in the darkness? Because that's those that refuse to love the truth, and we'll get more into that next week. But refusing to love the truth It's about people who desire to save their own skin more than to glorify the Lord. Our entire purpose for being on this planet is to glorify the Lord, to know him and to make him known. You can't make known a God you don't know. You might be able to tell stories about him, but that's not telling someone, this is what my God has done for me. I want you to meet my God. I want you to know my God. This is what my God has done for me in my life. This is who I was. This is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. And that going to be is a promise. God guarantees 
that those that live by faith are going to be like Christ. Wow. The last thing that happens to a church that has prostituted itself to the world and does not recognize truth anymore because it has become one with the world is no repentance. Not even the ability to see that repentance is needed. People that do not live under God's authority have nothing to repent about. What do we need to repent about if we're not living under God's authority? If you are living under God's authority, he is cluing you in every day to your sin. It's painful, isn't it? Yes, this means yes. It is painful to live under his authority, to fear him, and to allow the Holy Spirit to point out sin because confession is simply agreeing to what God already sees in you. Agreeing with the Lord. When God says, Letty, that was selfish. Yes, it was, Lord. Or I can say, I'm not as selfish as that person. I've done this and this and this. But when I say, yes, Lord, that was selfish, and I allow the spirit to bring guilt, healthy guilt, that brings about a turn in my life, that's repentance. If you're letting the devil guilt you about the past, that's not, that's false guilt. That's a trick of the devil to keep you from Jesus. Guilt is a powerful tool from the past. Guilt from the past, things that you've already made right with God. The devil will use those things to just torment you so that you are focused on the sin instead of on the Redeemer. So we'll talk more about that next week. But it's so important that we understand the difference between false guilt and the guilt that the Holy Spirit is bringing that's convicting sin so that we can have a heart change. So if we are not repenting, we are not being led by the Spirit. We're not having a change of heart. We're not turning from sin. We're not confessing our sin. And we're in trouble. One of the biggest things that we need to learn and and to recognize and to confess before the Lord is that every one of us is an addict. Oh, just because you're just because you don't do drugs and, and alcohol. You might be ad- addicted to your pride. You might have be addicted to a big mouth and having to give your opinion to everybody that didn't even ask for it. You might be addicted to a bad attitude. You might be addicted to flipping people off when you drive down the road, except you look around to make sure nobody from church is around. You might ha- have all kinds of addictions that are wicked and sinful and bring shame upon the Lord. And God is going to call us on all of those because he is molding us to holiness. And some addictions, like the one that I mentioned, and when the Lord brought that to mind again, I knew I needed to mention this again, uh, is in the arena of pornography is no different than uh, drugs and alcohol in that what is needed to overcome for 99% of men is you need to tell someone. You need to be part of a, of, a, of a group. And if anyone listening, anyone online that has not um, been a part of our series last year, and if you have any questions about how to overcome pornography, I ask that you would message Christopher. Um, he taught the Conquer series last year, and he can, he can help you get to the resources that you need uh, for how to overcome There is victory in the future for you. Don't think that because you've tried to do this on your own that and and have failed that you can't have victory. You can have victory. And so keep fighting the good fight. Get help because that is just what AA and other people need. We need to be able to confess and we need to be able to have others that have won this fight to help us to do it. So 
It's just like you and I sharpening one another. You know, we're walking this road together and we are needing accountability. Well, certain addictions need accountability on an ongoing basis and pornography is one of them. So I want us to turn to, in closing, I want for us to go to Psalm 32. Someone who understood repentance to the core of his being. Someone who loved truth in spite of the sin that mastered him every now and again. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. How beautiful is that? What a blessing is that? To know that your sins are covered because you have repented and you live a life of repentance. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. He knew what he had done was wrong, and it grieved him to his core. He was grieved. And when God was pressing him, and I hope that everyone in this room knows what, what this is. I hope that you understand exactly what David is talking about. Because if not, you've not yet gone to the place that you need to go. To be totally sick about your sin. For me to totally be sick about my sin, I know exactly what it's talking about. You can't breathe. You cannot breathe. Then, David says, I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I was drowning. I couldn't breathe. I had to acknowledge. God saw it already. God knows everything, but we still have to confess it to him. And sometimes we have to confess it to someone else. He said, I couldn't breathe until I confessed it. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me and the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. How beautiful is that? Brothers and sisters in Christ, if it's been a while before you sat still before the Lord, I invite you to do so today. The Bible is clear. Today, if you hear his voice, it's a big if. And I hope we can say today when I hear his voice, not if. Today when I hear his voice, I will not harden my heart. The church at large is living in deceit. The church at large does not recognize the truth. They've been so used to listening to lies and accepting the sweet taste of delusion because it is. The church is numb to the truth. The church has no clue what is coming. And because God says judgment is coming and because he's going to press everyone on this planet to make a decision for righteousness or evil, when the time comes that almost every decision has been made, he will release the dragon upon this world. And it will be like nothing we have ever seen. It will make the trumpets look like child's play. So I invite you to get serious about your intimacy with the Lord. If you are playing church, wake up. If you have no relationship with the Lord, Seek him while he may be found. He loves you with a love that cannot ever be measured. Your God loves you so much, he would have died if it was only you. That is incredible love. So may God bless you 
as you walk with him, as you desire to live under his authority, and as you desire to live a right life in his holy sight.